democracy. Now, it wasn't just political groups who took to the the voice of the right wing, that movement growing up in Europe. What you see is this taking place across the streets of Europe. This is Germany. Uh, the idea, this big umbrella campaign to say no to hate. Oh, what's new? Yes, to change. And protesters rally. What does that mean exactly? Change in what, in what way? Now, one of two things springs to mind in that regard. More immigration, maybe opening the door fully, <laughs> or is it the Lisbon Treaty? Because one thing is abundantly clear, the continual use of the term far right that the media and the politicians and the activists all spout off every chance they get. Referring to far nationalists as far right because of course the European Union as we all know, at some point down the line, wishes to remove nation states and become one big happy family, so to speak. And there's one fundamental issue that's really in the way, stands in the way for the time being of this uh, proposal being put forth and the process to begin. And that is, of course, nationalists, as well as borders, <laughs> to name a few. So for the time being, nationalists are the issue. You need to disregard nationalism because that's now all of a sudden a far-right trope and you need to be in favour of internationalism because nationalism is bad, but internationalism is the new and improved version. It's progressive. And it's Giva Hofstadt is in running to be the European's top job in the European Commission. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh no, not him. He says it's breathtaking to see so many Germans and other Europeans marching against nationalism for European unity. He says, uh, may this pro-European momentum translate into strong turnout at the election later on this week. We'll also uh, look at what happened in the capital of Germany. All these people, a real riot of colour, all those pinks and yellow saying, uh, Europe renite, they say. Uh, let's use culture to raise awareness of our own responsibility responsibility for the future of European democracy. Now, it wasn't just political groups who took to the street. Also, Amnesty and International were protesting. And also, so was Sea-Watch International, a group, what of a course, show. who've been key in the movement of migrants and, put, and protesting uh, for service. their rights as well. He said, what a way to celebrate our fourth anniversary by looking at a more united Europe. This course is all to come together to counter that nationalist, that populist voice. It wasn't just there where they were protesting <laughs> as well. This is the scene in Vienna. You can see people waving their, waving their flags of Europe, uh, celebrating there, and also in Stockholm as well, saying, rain won't dampen our mood. We're all about standing together for one united Europe. In December time, I made a video on Bridget Chapman, who was from a charity that works with migrants slash refugees that happened to arrive at Kent. And she was advocating for more refugees slash migrants and pretty much hinted at, the, at an open door policy to be implemented for these people. You fast forward to the weekend has passed and the migrants that were intercepted at the weekend heading for Kent brought her back to the forefront again to pretty much repeat a hell of a lot of the things she repeated back in December, which is <laughs> rather bizarre. Six odd months later, near enough, and she's still using the same points that she used in December. And it's not as if those points were relatively convincing first time round, but uh, nonetheless. The time I look, France was a very safe first world country. Have any sympathy for people who are travelling by boat across the Channel? Aren't pretty desperate then? Well, no, I think they are pretty desperate because you don't, by definition, you don't make that very dangerous journey across the Channel what in are a they? small boat. What? I have to assume that people arriving in the English Channel on a boat are only there because they were desperate. They were fleeing whatever it may be, and they are there out of des out of sheer desperation. It's ludicrous because first and foremost, you have no idea who that person is, who these people are, and what their circumstances were. Second of all, for every one boat that arrives that happens to have a child on board, how many come across the Mediterranean and the English Channel that don't have children on board? So it's the same level of compassion directed towards them, it's the same assumptions thrown towards them regarding desperation, or is that just for when they happen to have a child with them? People have a tendency to 
create an environment in which people could quite easily exploit their kindness and their compassion. Even if there is a family that arrive on a boat that fleed from wherever it may be and did so out of sheer desperation, another family could arrive on a boat or a group of men could arrive on a boat and just proclaim that they are there for the exact same reason. And because you've jumped to the assumption, the initial assumption that by definition, these people are doing what they're doing out of sheer desperation, with that being the fundamental thing that you've all proclaimed to, to stand by, you could quite easily just brush over the fact that some people may not necessarily be there for legitimate reasons. Because as far as you're concerned anyway, <laughs> the more the merrier. We established that in December. It's all very well and good to proclaim that these people are there out of sheer desperation, but it's no skin of your nose what reason they, they give to you. It's no skin of your nose whatsoever. As far as you're concerned, if they arrive, they should be allowed in. You don't, by definition, you don't make that very dangerous journey across the channel well, what in are a they, small boat. What are they desperate about? They're living in France. I mean, there are quite a lot of British people who quite happily go and live in France. I don't know, living in quite the same situations than in France. They're living in really, really bad situations. Who are we talking about here exactly? Are we talking about the refugees and Africans, the migrants that uh, exploited the refugee crisis? You know, these people fail to acknowledge whether it be deliberately or they genuinely are oblivious, they fail to acknowledge why there's so much resentment towards this so-called crisis that <laughs> really isn't a crisis at this point. Because the Syrian refugee crisis of old, which is now morphed into the, re the Iranian crisis, refugee crisis, there's still a, a major issue regarding the numbers that certain countries in the European Union have been seeing. Because for every one refugee that may very well have entered a particular country, a multitude of uh, African migrants followed suit. And the same thing is occurring at Cali. Currently, still to this day, African men still camping around uh, uh, certain areas of France along the coastline, waiting for their opportunity to head towards the UK illegally. <laughs> so at the end of the day, if these people aren't prepared to apply for asylum in France, then it's nobody's fault by their own, and it's nobody's problem by their own. Around Calais and Dunkirk. But that's through choice, isn't it? That's because, that's because they've chosen not to seek asylum in France. Um, they've chosen... What we've got to understand, I do think that the UK has a really overinflated sense of its own attraction to people. Literally said that exact, the exact same point in the video that I made on Dece in December. It was a shite point then, and it's still a shite point now. You could quite easily apply for asylum in France, and they've not bothered. So if they happen to find themselves in circumstances or in an environment which you consider to be inappropriate or uh, dire, then that's their problem. It's nobody else's problem, nor burden. <laughs> they put themselves in that position. They have decided to take it upon themselves to traverse the European continent, country to country in order to end up in France and wait for their opportunity to enter the UK illegally. It takes about 10 times more um, asylum seekers than we do. France takes about three more times. Um, we have to do our bit. Um, no, we don't have to do our bit at all. In fact, a good portion of the countries in question in the European Union don't have to actually do their bit because there's a difference between refugees and migrants, but there's a conflation that's been done by design, it's deliberate. So in one breath we're talking about refugees when half of the time, if not three quarters of the time, it's not refugees we see. Why do we have to do our bit? Who says we have to do our bit? Why do we need to open uh, open the doors to people that have decided to live in Cali while they wait for their opportunity to jump on the back of a lorry or climb in a boat? We don't have any legal obligation to take these people in whatsoever. But these people are a very small number of the people coming and, and, yes. and they are joining, they are choosing to join as they have an absolute right to do um, an ex <laughs> existing community where they have links, where they have a prospect of building a life in this country. You don't know that they've got links. 
Well, wait a second, wait a second. Right you have, they have, they have an that. absolute right to do. Why, why are they then getting on dinghies to go across the channel? Why aren't they going through the, uh, the formal procedure to gain access to this country? I mean, since when do we just say anyone in the world can come here? I mean, France and Germany have taken more. France, France, not through choice. They just got an open border policy. Germany, I mean, the German Chancellor and her body have, have got a lot of punishment at the polls for opening their country up. But people, fewer people come to this country because we're an island nation and we don't have open borders. That, that's, that's, that's the reality about that. Why do you think that people people have an absolute right to go and live in any country they darn well choose to well it's not just me i mean it's under the geneva convention because no one is illegal am i right they've got a good asylum claim they're mostly kurdish they're mostly iranian kurds how do you know that these people are what you say they are you've not met them <laughs> she did the exact same thing in the video in december as well she seems to know what these people are and who they are and she seems to know their circumstances yet she has no idea who the fuck they are. We're from a repressed minority in that country and under the Geneva Convention they have a right to seek asylum in a country of their choosing. And they have a right like to, but they have a duty to seek asylum in the first safe country they arrive in. That ain't Britain. Well the first safe country wasn't France. I can guarantee well, you they... that. Well... <laughs> and what's your point? <laughs> like, uh... It wasn't France, exactly. How many countries have they traversed in order to find themselves at Cali? <laughs> okay, well then.